welcome to the latest episode of the Informing Choices Minipod. This is the third in our series looking at the implications on the future of work in partnership with Working the Future. Today, we're venturing into the complex world of globalisation and geopolitics, the fragmentation of global systems. Sounds like a bit of a mouthful, doesn't it? But stick with me. Have you ever noticed how the world seems to be pulling apart just as much as coming together? And that's what we're diving into today. First off, we'll break down what we really mean by the fragmentation of global systems. It's all about understanding the forces pulling us in different directions on a global scale. Next, we'll be identifying three big drivers powering this trend. Is it technology, politics, economics, maybe a mix of all three? But here's the kicker. What we'll also do is we'll look at the world in 2030. We'll explore an optimistic scenario and a less optimistic, a dystopian scenario, potentially, about how fragmentation possibly leads to innovation on the one hand or a lack of innovation on the other, perhaps to conflict and isolation. And because we're not just here to ponder, uh, but to act, and we'll wrap up with some ideas about how organisations could take action now to build resilience and success in the future. But once again, the first order of business is to welcome founding director of Working the Future, Kat Bernard, to this collaborative series of podcasts. Kat, welcome back. Hello, Steve. Hi, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Let's start with this, shall we? Uh, we said that we'd look at what we mean by fragmentation of global systems, and I kind of really lightly touched on it in that introduction. But talk us through this fragmentation. How serious is it? Whereabouts are we seeing fragmentation? Gosh, well, so um, when we first started looking at globalization, one of the things that we recognized was that there wasn't a clear, consistent definition of globalization. So starting point number one is that we all use the word um, but we not entirely always on the same page in our understanding of it. And I guess because I studied languages at university, I'm a big fan of a dictionary, if in doubt. So I think, you know, it, let, let's start by just um, making sure we're all on the same page with what we understand globalisation to mean. And we took our definition from the Collins uh, English Dictionary and that dictionary tells us that the that globalization is the emergence since the 1980s of a single world market dominated by multinational companies leading to diminished capacity for national governments to control their economies which is which is quite an impactful statement right there because that immediately triggers to my mind a conflict between nation states and multinational corporations that have demonstrated over the last several decades that they are to some degree more powerful than those nation states. And one could um, illustrate that by the topic of where these multinational beer moths pay tax and whether or not they pay their fair share of tax in each um, legal jurisdiction that they operate in. And I think we can probably safely say they do not pay their fair share of tax in each legal jurisdiction. So, so that's one thing, but you went on to ask me um, a question about fragmentation and I think that our global systems have been in a state of fragmentation for some time, actually. I remember reading a book by, um, oh gosh, what's his name now? Robert, um, what's the name of the ITV guy? Robert? Peston. Robert Peston, thank you very much. Um, about 
the what happened with Brexit and so on. And he talked about how from the early 90s up until the mid 2010s, we had had the single most prolonged period of economic stability ever recorded. So a 30 year period of um, economic stability and reasonably free, unchallenged trade, which of course is globalization. But then, and, and, and in the background, you know, in the very late 1980s, early 1990s, we saw the collapse of the former USSR. And that certainly the end of, the official end of the Cold War seemed to denote um, uh, an era of stability and peace and international cooperation and so on. And we saw a great many, um, we saw a great many international um, cooperations take place during that time. But in fact, it's not really true, is it? Because in, in, in parallel, we've seen a great, you know, a great number of international um, conflicts. And I guess it's what we what we pay attention to. But I think moving, and, and I remember reading in The Economist, which is obviously a British um, publication, somewhere around 2018, maybe 2019, they'd done a piece, an opinion piece on what they called globalization, which was really drawing our attention to the fact that, um, that globalization wasn't without its frictions and that we were starting to see and could expect to see increasing um, levels of um, friction between um, trading states internationally. So, so I think it's an interesting one for us to observe as humans because we in, unless there's abject calamity we tend to think that everything is reasonably stable and yet we only see what we want to see and there are all manner of kind of permutations and um frictions bubbling away behind the scene i think covid was a brilliant um leveler insofar as it it tore our blinkers away once and for all. And we we watched the global and national scrambles for PPE, for the protective equipment, and also the race to find a viable um, vaccine to protect citizens against the pandemic. We also watched and I think this was an almost universal thing, but I'm not sure, the toilet roll and the flour, you know, in supermarkets running out. But for the first time in modern history, we became very much more aware of how fragile our international supply chains were. And um, obviously since the pandemic, uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine. Ukraine has been... Um, heralded in as being a, a key agricultural producer, a key producer of fertilizers, a key producer of many staple ingredients that underpin the smooth functioning of society. And of course, it seems to be the case that one of Russia's war strategies is to disrupt those supply chains as, as, pos as far as possible. And we can also see now in 2024, the frictions taking place in, in, in the Middle East, which is also causing absolute chaos, the likes of which we don't know quite yet what the long term fallout will be um, of the ongoing um, war between um, Israel and Hamas. But I think it's fair to say that there will be economic consequences that will have big um, implications for all of us as consumers. Um, so I know that's a big, long ramble, but um, I think the fact the fact that I always find myself every time I go to the supermarket now, I find it fascinating that as consumers, we are impervious to exactly where any of our food comes from. And I think that's a really interesting example of just how fragile our global systems are now.
And I, and I, one of the things that, that, that strikes me about that, you, you, you mentioned the kind of the period, uh, the 30 year or so period after the end of the Cold War. Um, and arguably through most of the Cold War, um, there was a reasonable amount of stability as well, perhaps not the same economic growth that we enjoyed afterwards. But, you know, from a, a from a geopolitical situation, the world seemed pretty steady across both those periods. But I wonder how much of what we're seeing now is much more the norm. We just happen to have lived through an extended period of geopolitical stability, the likes of which, you know, we've arguably not seen before and, and perhaps we won't see again, which I find, you know, completely fascinating. Um, what do you see, though, as and I, and I guess to some extent you've touched on some of these, but what do you see as the three drivers that underpin what you've just described around the fragmentation of, of global systems? What are the what are the three key trends? Well, so the. Um... I think political tensions are rising, aren't they? I think, you know, we, 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 we've, globalization was augmented by the emergence of the World Wide Web and um, kind of frictionless trade in the sense that anybody with a smart device and an internet connection could, could set themselves up as a micro producer in any quarter of the world. And if you look at the world that we live in at the moment, we are absolutely inundated by choice um, across a whole spectrum of different products. But, you know, um, foods, you know, basic foodstuffs, basic, basic uh, ingredients right the way through to um, things like, you know, digital contents and channels. But, but our, our nation states are no longer playing nicely with one another, are they? And I think, you know, Brexit was perhaps one of the first most visible manifestations of that. But in the, in the years following Brexit, we've started to witness the fragilities that exist within the... 27 member states of the European Union. I mean, that's anything but plain sailing. But you look at, you know, you look at the United States of America and in the 2020s, it becomes ever clearer that the United States of America are almost on occasion united in name only mm -hmm. and that actually the states themselves um, operate at odds with one another. You look at the frictions over in Asia Pacific between China and and and, and Taiwan. Um, you look at the frictions that have been going on for a long time between China and India, as a for instance, and you start to see it. I find it really interesting how we sleepwalk ourselves into into the illusion of comfort. And for a very short while, everything was great and um, living standards were improving for most people in most parts of the world. And I know that we've entered a period where we used to talk about third world countries, but third world countries don't really exist anymore because the generalised standard of living has improved. So as, as an overall, we're probably better off, but we hoodwinked ourselves, didn't we, by the illusion that things were more stable than they actually are. And now that we've got these meta crises of resource depletion and the climate crisis, you can start to see real, the real relationships start to play out again. And it's anybody's guess, really, um, what will happen and which country will exert dominance to shore up um, the resources that it feels it most needs in order to sustain its populations over time? So, in that, in that, in that one answer to uh, to that question about the three the three drivers behind fragmentation of global systems, um, you've spoken about um, climate, geopolitics, and resource depletion. <laughs> 
uh, or resource scarce, uh, resource scarcity, I suppose, more mm. accurately. Um, and um, uh, they do feel like three critical drivers um, as to why different countries around the world are positioning themselves um, in perhaps slightly different ways. Uh, but it does feel much more uncertain, less secure. And it's hard to see that going away over the near to medium term, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, I, I'm not an expert in any of these areas, but um, if you think about the tensions that are rising over the supply of certain rare minerals, which are integral to the ongoing production of um, circuit boards or car batteries or whatever, whatever, you know, those tensions are rising. But in actual fact, if you look further out, what about the ongoing global supply of um, fresh water, of, of the water that humans need to survive? And that is already, you know, we're already pushing our planetary supplies of these absolute essentials to the extreme limits. And so it's one thing to fight over mineral resources that are advantageous to the advancement of economies. But it's another thing entirely to fight over resources that are essential to the ongoing sustenance of human life, right? Yeah, yeah it's a bit, bit more of a basic need, isn't there? Yeah. Um, so what's your, what's your sense then of how globalisation and geopro uh, geopolitics will potentially change global systems into the future? What needs to happen, do you think, for us to achieve an optimistic outcome? Um, and what needs to happen beyond more of the same, I suppose, to give us a more pessimistic outcome come 2030 and beyond so i think in the very first instance i think it's incumbent upon all of us to leverage our intelligence and actually learn more about international supply chains and where stuff comes from and also in in parallel you know ask some pretty uh, poignant questions about whether or not we actually need all the stuff that we mindlessly consume because if you don't need the material items that are consumed and you can do without them and they don't negatively uh, impact on your standard of living, which let's face it, Steve, a lot of the stuff that gets consumed in the modern age in the Western world is consumed fairly mindlessly. I think there's an awful lot of stuff that we could do without that would actually uh, lessen our reliance on um, on other countries where the tensions are well on the way to um, becoming more fractious. I think there's, dare I say, an awful lot of stuff that is mass produced in the Far East that we just don't need. Mm. Um, I think in terms of things like the security, food security, for instance, I think we need to become infinitely more discerning and understanding of where f our food comes from. And, you know, it's, a, it's an absolute tragedy to me that in 2024, our farmers are having to go down into central London and protest outside the Houses of Parliament over the really the lack of support that they've had since Brexit when most of those farmers would have voted for Brexit in the belief that they would have had access to better agricultural conditions but you know the fact of the matter is that we're prioritizing the import of fresh products over the production of domestically produced um fresh staple ingredients and we should be having far more of an informed educative 
uh, information flow so that we actually understand where, our, you know, where does our, where does our food optimally come from in order to better sustain our national economy? And I don't think we have any of those conversations. And I think, you know, it's an interesting interplay. You can extend out, you look at the 2024 organisations are of most, you know, of all denominations being charged with becoming more sustainable and looking at things like carbon footprinting and so on. But too few organisations even there are thinking about where their supply chains are, are situated, what they're made up of, and whether or not those supply chains are optimal for their local communities. So I think thinking about thinking systemically is a is is a key thing, is a key thing, and I think too few people in the industry today are thinking systemically because we've become so accustomed to not having to think about these things, right? Yeah, yeah, very true. Is your sense also that you know an, an optimistic outcome here, um, despite the likely bumps in the road before we get there? Um, is more likely because a really pessimistic outcome is just too awful to consider. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, 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 I do. I do. I mean, you know, again, like we talked about in the last episode, we could get really, really dystopian about what a what a bad outcome could look like. But but the upside, actually, the Sunlit Uplands, you know, I didn't personally vote for Brexit. I was broken hearted when we chose to leave the European Union. But in the face of that, were we to be minded to do so? I think we have this amazing opportunity to reboot our national economy and really double down on, on you know, some of the innovations and, and um, creative thinking that as a nation we've been absolutely brilliant at historically. I think we have an excellent opportunity to onshore or at the very least to friendshore to work out who our allies are. And let's face it again, we've not been brilliant, have we, in the last eight years at, at really um, working out who our closest allies are, aside from the United States, which... I don't think I'm alone in saying if Trump comes into power in the end at the end of 24 for a second term, who wants to be friends? You know, who wants to be friends with that kind of crazy um, dictatorship? Um, but I think, you know, we, we, we ought to be thinking about who our closer trade partners would be in a way you know, how did we end up in a situation where our former, one of our four, one of our many former prime ministers went out and got, you know, trade deals with Australia and New Zealand for the supply of meat in the absence of, you know, um, or as a replacement alternative to our European trade agreements. I mean, that we have the ability to produce our own livestock in this country. Why did we not focus on bolstering our own economy over and above seeking out trade deals with pretty much the furthest away countries in the world? Yeah. It's hard. I know it's hard. I feel like it's hard to be um, discerning about geopolitics without becoming political, right? <laughs> it's a challenge, isn't it? And, 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 and perhaps therein lies the, the, you know, the real underlying uh, reason for some of this fragmentation that we've seen, um, that it is political. Um, mm. uh, and, and perhaps, perhaps political, um, even at the expense of economics, because, you know, the, the way that we have these kind of long winding supply chains all the way back to China are, are driven by economics, aren't they? Um, yeah. And economics continues to happen despite the politics, except 
when the politics becomes too unpalatable. And I guess that's the real risk, of the fragmentation that we've been speaking about, that the politics becomes so unpalatable that actually the economics that have underpinned what we've been trying to do for decades kind of breaks, becomes unsustainable. And you then risk, you know, different kind of blocks um, with very little communication between either. So you perhaps have at some point in the future a Russia-China block on, on one side, um, a West European bits of, of Asia and the United States on the other, and uh, another block led by unaligned countries, uh, perhaps Brazil and India, you know, and, and never the twain kind of thing. So um, the, the fragmentation does seem to be particularly problematic. And uh, maybe it's just the seriousness of the challenges that lie ahead that will actually allow us in the future to become less fragmented again. Mm. Um, finally, on, on this episode, we know, given what we've spoken about and, and what else is in this part of, of the report, what action could organisations take right now with this insight to help them uh, think about their success in the future? Well, so one of the one of my recommendations would be actually something that has already been documented as taking place, and it is this idea that um, organisations and and nation states are 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 increasingly looking at what is being termed in the press as friend shoring. So, identifying more local sources of supply chains that are more amicable and less fraught than some of the previous supply chains that we may have taken for granted. So I think really starting to go a bit more forensic on your business supply chains to understand where goods, resources and knowledge come from and 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 then once you've done that forensic analysis to experiment with scenario planning actually and to look at you know to, to, to i think that's a really useful activity to look at the plausibility of certain uh future events converging and how that could play out and how that could impact on your business i think you know having investing in strategic foresight is 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 very prudent right now given the raised levels of uncertainty on the global landscape. And I would also say with that, and I and I appreciate that this does sound probably a bit extreme, but I don't think there's any danger whatsoever in writing disaster recovery plans and then drilling them, because that is that is a form of future proofing, isn't it? That is a form of resilience. And it, if we carry on as usual pretending that everything is fine and dandy and if we can just get past the general election things will go back to the way that they were in 2019 that is literally delusional i think you know we have to start looking more diligently at the reality of our landscape and then try to prioritize what could happen and then de-risk against that and you know what if none of those things come to pass that's absolutely fine n n you know no harm done but at least you're at least organizationally you're you're more prepared and preparedness cannot be understated i don't think in these uncertain times uh, that's been that's been really brilliant. And I think if I sort of encapsulate what, what we've done here is we've uh, spoken quite a lot about the complexities and the seriousness of some of these fragmentation of global systems. Um, but we've also, I think, been pretty clear about how they impact what we're trying to do locally. Um, and I think you're completely right. What we're, What you're really saying here is part of your insurance policy for your organization needs to be thinking about what could go wrong so that you either prevent it going wrong or have a plan B. Having a plan B, my goodness me, I mean, every organization needs a plan B right now. Plan B helps you adapt, evolve, survive and thrive. So rather than doggedly sticking to your 
growth plan or your your the business plan that you've created mm. for perhaps more stable um chartable landscapes have your alternative what if scenarios because if you can get your head around your what if scenarios you are infinitely more likely to overcome them should they happen and you know you've worked as a futurist for a long time Steve I've been looking at the future of work for coming on eight years now neither of us know what the future holds exactly if we knew that we'd be coining a trade as mediums and clairvoyance right (laughs) The, the point that I am making is that you can deduce that certain things will happen with very, very broad brushstrokes based on an analysis of the pre-existing trends. And the one thing that I know that you've succinctly um, surmised also today is that we are now far, far out at sea and stability and certainty is a comfort of yesteryear but we're not going to arrive back on those shores at any time soon in a way that is plain sailing i think that's a really powerful point to um end this episode on cat thank you so much for your time again today it's been absolutely brilliant well it's been brilliant far-reaching conversation Um, In the podcast description, you'll find a link to Working the Future website and also how you can contact Kat to find out more about uh, what she and her company does. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a future episode. And do let your friends and colleagues know about the Informing Choices Midipod. And we'll see you again on another episode soon.